thank you uh, thank you Bora, for introducing me and uh, thank you to all the organizers uh, I, I hope my screen is visible right okay uh, so this talk as i have as gaurav has mentioned this is like a quick introduction to the lovash local lemma and i will be just uh, briefly highlighting what is the idea of the lovash local lemma and uh, what are the what are the most commonly used variants of the local lemma so let's let's jump into it so firstly what are probabilistic methods so probabilistic methods in combinatorics they often help us to prove that a certain combinatorial object exists uh, with some desired properties that we want uh, and we try to show that that exists in a well-defined probability space with some positive probability so that is the main idea of uh, probabilistic methods and sometimes what we want uh, what we want an object that does not have some bad qualities uh, so for example let's say there are some bad events a1 to ak and sometimes we define an object in terms of those bad events a1 to ak and we want uh, the object to not have any of those properties. So, so we want to avoid all the bad events. Now, uh, so obviously a non-trivial lower bound on the intersection of AI bars, which is the complement of the AIs, that's what we want. Uh, so the Lovash local lemma basically helps us in expressing this particular uh, lower bound and having a non-trivial lower bound on the avoidance probability. This is what we know as the avoid avoidance probability. So before jumping into the lemma, let's see what is a dependency graph. So let's say A1 to AN are some events in a probability space. So we define a graph uh, with the vertices as one to N and uh, we call it a dependency graph. Uh, when we put an edge between the events, uh, between the indices of the particular events, uh, such that AI is mutually independent of all AJ with which it does not have an edge. Here, mutually independent is important because that's what we use in the Lovash local lemma. Uh, so that's the dependency graph. And now that we know what the dependency graph is, we can uh, we can come to the Lovash local lemma, the statement of the lemma. What does the statement say? So let's look at it. So suppose A1 to AN are events in an arbitrary probability space for which D is a dependency graph. Now, suppose that there exists some constant, some real numbers, x1 to xn, which are all in between 0 and 1, and uh, probability of ai, uh, this is the most important part, that the probability of each event happening is less than or equal to xi times product of 1 minus xj, where i and j have an edge in the dependency graph. So if this thing happens for every i between 1 and n, then we have that the probability of uh, none of those events occurring is greater than or equal to product of one minus xi uh, for all i. And uh, this thing is greater than zero since we chose each xi to be less than one. So this product is obviously greater than zero. So here we get with the positive probability that none of those events occur. None of the bad events A1 to A in occur. Now this Lovash local lemma is a pretty useful tool. Like it's very simple as you can see, uh, it can be very simply uh, stated, but it's a really useful tool. It has several different applications in combinatorics, not only combinatorics, but also computer science and uh, information theory. And there have been several different uses over the last um, 30 or 40 years since it has come out. Uh, so I'll be... Uh, exploring one of the applications of the lowest local lemma uh, which is perhaps the first application that was there uh, but before that i would like to introduce to you something called the symmetric local lemma so this is a variant of the original lowest local lemma so the one that i showed you before this is known as the asymmetric local lemma and now i'll come to the symmetric version and i'll mention why this is called the symmetric uh, so suppose a1 to an are events in any probability space as before these are the bad events that we want to avoid and suppose that each of the uh, each of these bad events is mutually independent of all other events except at most d many others so it basically this says that in the dependency graph the maximum degree is d for any vertex and suppose that the probability of each ai is less than or equal to some p some uh, p which is uh, this is the same p for all the uh, all the events uh, if we have that uh, the probability of any bad event happening is less than or equal to p then uh, if we have this particular condition that e times p times d plus 1 is less than or equal to 1 here e is the natural logarithm constant if we have this then we have that the probability of none of the events uh, occurring is greater than 0 
so this is the symmetric the, this is the statement of the symmetric local lemma and it's symmetric because uh, as you can see the uh, well the probability of each event is low is upper bounded by one uh, small peak uh, which is important and uh, we will have, we will take a look at the proof of this uh, symmetric local lemma using the asymmetric version that i showed you before but uh, before that let me mention that the original bound for the symmetric local lemma was uh, 4 pd less than or equal to 1 instead of this one and then spencer proved that p less than or equal to 1 by e times d plus 1 works in place of 1 by 4 d and that has been subsequently improved to 1 by e d uh, maybe I can mention one or two lines about uh, how this improvement has been uh, possible after the talk. So, uh, so this is the symmetric local lemma. Now, we'll quickly take a look at how it is proved. Now, the, for the proof of the symmetric version, first we note that uh, if d is equal to zero, which means that if none of the events are dependent on each other, then it means that all the events are mutually independent and the probability, as you can see, is uh, it's trivially positive. But if not, in the non-trivial case, then in the dependency graph, each vertex has degree at most d. Uh, now, so in order to use the asymmetric version, all we have to do is to choose those xi's. And we choose each xi as equal to 1 by d plus 1 and uh, for each i. So now that we have this, uh, in order to have that uh, pp d plus 1 less than or equal to 1, we observe that uh, 1 minus 1 by d plus 1 power d is greater than 1 by e for every d greater than or equal to 1. So this is a sort of an empirical observation that you can prove via calculus or any other method. And this basically gives us that P is less than or equal to one by D plus one times E, which is which was given to us. And this is less than one by D plus one times one minus one by D plus one power D. So this is sort of the form that we had uh, wanted in the original uh, asymmetric version. So the conclusion of the, I mean, the proof of the symmetric version, this follows trivially from the asymmetric case. Now I'll show you an example of how powerful this actually is. So this example is in the two coloring of hypergraphs. So consider a hypergraph H where each hyper H has at least K vertices where K is greater than or equal to three since we are talking about hypergraphs. And each hyper H intersects at most D many other hyper edges. Now we would say that a hypergraph is two colorable. If let's say we can color each vertex with one of two colors, red or blue, so that no hyper edge should become monochromatic. So that's when we say that the hyper edge, uh, so, uh, sorry, the hyper graph is two colorable. So what we want to know is that for what values of K and D would we be able to say that the hyper graph is two colorable? And uh, let's see if the lowest local lemma wasn't there, how would we approach this problem? So, uh, the, uh, so let's say the E1 to E and are the hyper edges and we consider a random coloring of each hyper edge. And uh, suppose that we define AI to be the event where the edge, uh, the hyper edge EI turns out to be monochromatic. And obviously we want the probability of A1, A2, A bar, A in bar, all of this to be greater than zero. As, and that would imply that two coloring of H must exist with positive probability. Now uh, let's assume that a particular hyper edge has LI many vertices. Uh, then the probability of that uh, particular event uh, AI, uh, meaning that the particular hyper edge being monochromatic is two by two power LI, and that is less than or equal to one by, uh, sorry, two power one minus K. And this would uh, mean that the probability of uh, it not being uh, monochromatic is at least one minus two power uh, one minus K. So if the events were all independent, then we had nothing to worry because this probability intersection of AI bar would break into product of the probability of the AI bars and since all the events are independent, and this is greater than or equal to one minus two power one minus k, uh, two power one minus k to the power n, which is greater than zero. But we cannot do this because the AIs, the events are not independent because the hyper edges overlap. So that's where the local lemma walks in. So using the symmetric local lemma, how we would approach this is that, uh, let's say, uh, obviously each event AI depends on only those events for which the hyper edge EI and EJ have some non-trivial intersection. Now, since each hyper edge, we were given that each hyper edge intersects at most D many other events, uh, D many other hyper edges. So one particular event AI would depend on at most D many other events. Now, if we use the original bound for the symmetric local lemma, which was 4PD less than or equal to one, then we want the probability of AI, which is P, is less than or equal to two power one minus K as we saw before. And we want this to be less than or equal to one by four D. And if we rearrange, we get that D is less than or equal to two power K minus three. 
and I mean taking this would satisfy this inequality. And by the symmetric local lemma, we would be able to say that the hypergraph in this case is two colorable. So that's the beautiful application of the uh, symmetric local lemma. And uh, so there are plenty more applications of, of the, the lowest local lemma, as I mentioned, in various different fields. So yeah, so that's I think there's a talk tomorrow about uh, uh, there's another talk tomorrow about the uh, local lemma. And uh, yeah, so that's where I end my talk, which is a short introduction to the local lemma. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. So do we have any questions for the speaker? Uh, maybe I will ask a quick question. So could you yes. also mention some other example where this has been used? Right, so the there's this, yeah. So there's this uh, problem in uh, computer science. It's at the intersection of theoretical computer science and logic, computation and logic. It's called the K satisfiability problem. So it's basically asks when a particular conjuncting no conjunctive normal form is uh, K satisfiable. And there, the, so it's uh, it, like, if you see the problem it, by itself, it's a pretty, it's, a, it's an NP hard problem. But uh, if you use the lowest local lemma, that actually turns out to be really simple. So you can put a really simple condition on the number of clauses in the problem. And that would, uh, that would sort of uh, be, uh, that would sort of allow the lowest local lemma to be used. And it, uh, there's a very simple result that says when a particular conjunctive normal form is K satisfiable. So that's a pretty cool example that I also found out. Okay, good. So if there are no more questions, then let's thank the speaker.